Chapter 3. What is a church? What is a church member? Instead of first century Jerusalem, we turn to a sidewalk outside of an Italian bistro in Washington, D.C. That should make for a nice change of scenery. My friend Coyle and I had just eaten lunch and were talking about church membership. Then Coyle asked me this tough question. What's the difference between two Christians who belong to the same church and two Christians who belong to different churches? Maybe you can picture me standing there, several new red marinara stains on my shirt, staring at him blankly. I wasn't sure how to answer. But it's a great question for getting to the heart of what a local church and its membership are. Think about it like this. Coyle belongs to my church. My good friend Mike, who is also a Christian, belongs to a church out on the edge of the city by the airport. The question is then, how does my relationship with Coyle differ, differ from my relationship with Mike? Am I obligated to the two men differently? You could say that all three of us belong to the body of Christ and the people of God and the universal church, as in the church with a capital C. Furthermore, all three of us are called to love each other, to pray for each other, to encourage each other, to rebuke sin in each other, and even to care for each other financially in, as occasion requires. So what's the difference? What should I have said to Coil? If there is no difference, then we'd have to say that the local church does not exist. It would be like saying there's no difference between my relationship with my wife and my relationship with other women. That would be true only if the marital covenant did not exist. But the marriage does exist, and so there's a big difference in the relationships. Likewise, the local church does exist, and so it seems as if there should be some difference in those relationships. But what is it? Here's a hint. My church and I are capable of exercising formal church discipline over Coyle, but not over Mike. That is, Jesus has given me, as a member of the church, a formal judicial role to play in Coyle's Christian life that he has not given me to play in Mike's life. But understanding what this judicial role is requires us to ask what the local church and its members are. That's the goal of this chapter and the next. And these might be the two most important chapters in the book. Institutional and organic. There are at least two ways for us to answer the question of what a local church is. We can answer the question organically or institutionally. We can look at the flesh or the bones. People these days love talking organically. Flesh is soft and yielding and pretty. The thing is, flesh without bones isn't very pleasant, pleasant to look at, either. So we really need both. To understand the difference, think of the marriage analogy once more. If we were to talk about a marriage organically, we talk about all the wonderful things that a married couple gets to do. Live together, make a home together, engage in marital intimacy, have children, share confidences, and so forth. These are the wonderful activities that we associate with the marriage relationship. To talk about a marriage institutionally, however, is to talk about the stuff that our culture understands less and less and is starting to leave behind. We gather in the sight of God and in the face of this company to join this man and this woman. If anyone can show just cause why they may not be lawfully joined, with this ring I thee wed. I pronounce that they are husband and wife. Behind all of these Western phrases is the idea of what the Bible calls a one flesh union, and we might call a marital covenant. This covenant is the skeleton. It's the rule structure that builds a platform for the relationship and separates a man's relationship with his wife from his relationship with all other women, and vice versa. It's the hard surface goblet that holds the wine of marital activity in place. Lose the goblet, and you pretty quickly lose the wine. See Proverbs 5, 15 through 16. The world today likes the activities, but not the institution. 
which is why more and more couples live together without getting married. They want the wine, but not the wine glass. Sure enough, everything's getting messy. Then again, many people choose the activity, but not the institution, because they have watched their parents or grandparents stay hitched and stay miserable. Those are the rules, was the explanation. They didn't witness their fathers tenderly pursue their mothers, or their mothers cherish their fathers. They only saw eyes staring into space and mouths numbly exchanging information. They saw life, vibrant life, only during the screaming matches. How ironic and tragic. That's not what we want either. Both rules and activities have been ordained by God, bones and flesh. And so it is with the local church. Jesus and the kingdom. Let's start with the institutional description, the bones, the wine goblet. And this is what people today most commonly miss or avoid. The union of relationships that turns an ordinary group of Christians presto, into a local church is not a till-death-do-you-part union, but it is something, as the possibility of church discipline makes evident. In chapter 1, we call the local church an outpost or an embassy. To elaborate, here's my single-sentence institutional definition of a local church. A local church is a group of Christians who regularly gather in Christ's name to officially affirm and oversee one another's membership in Jesus Christ and his kingdom through gospel preaching and gospel ordinances. Yes, this definition is a little clunky, but every word is packed with purpose. Before unpacking it, I want you to see where I'm getting it. You might have noticed that in chapter 2's search for membership sightings on the pages of the New Testament, we left out Jesus and the Gospels. Why? In part, it's because Jesus talked about the kingdom far more than he talked about the church. The epistles, on the other hand, have the opposite emphasis. Get this. Jesus in the Gospels mentions church two times and kingdom 49 times, just in the Gospel of Matthew. Paul's letters mention church 43 times and kingdom 14 times. Jesus talked about the kingdom. Paul talked about the church. What's going on? This might surprise you, but it is Jesus' emphasis on the kingdom that establishes the church as an institution. Paul wrote more in terms of the organic church, which we'll consider in the next chapter. What does Jesus' kingdom have to do with the church? Once upon a time, there was a kingdom. To answer that, let's turn to a story. Once upon a time, there was a kingdom called Israel. As in all kingdoms, Israel had a king and a land and a set of laws. But unlike most kingdoms, the citizens of Israel had an especially important job to do. Israel was to represent God on earth. It's as if God sent out a press release to all the nations of the earth, explaining that Israel was his and that the nations should watch them to see what he was like. Was God merciful or unmerciful? Just or unjust? Watch this nation to find out, said the press release. He had given them an elaborate set of laws so that they would know precisely what to do. Sadly, Israel fade, uh, failed abysmally at its job. They acted like insecure teenagers who cared too much about the opinions of their peers and imitated the nations instead of imitating God. Maybe they thought they were too cool for God's law. This made the nations think that God was nothing special, after all. In fact, he must be a lot like them. Then one day, along came a man named Jesus, who said at least four kingdom-toppling things. One, God was firing Israel. They were losing their jobs of representing him. Matthew 3, 9 through 12, 8, 11 through 12. 2. Jesus was the one who would now represent the Heavenly Father. Matthew 3, 17, 11, 27, John 14, 9. He was, in fact, God and the perfect image of God. 
Colossians 1.15. 3. God was establishing a kingdom, not as a place like Israel, but as his rule over a particular set of people. And this kingdom was for people who were repentant, poor in spirit, and humble like children. Matthew 4.17, 5.3, 18.3. 4. The citizens of his kingdom, whom he would purchase through his death on the cross, would join him in representing God on earth. Matthew 5.48, Romans 8.29, 1 Corinthians 15.49, 2 Corinthians 3.18, Colossians 3, 9-10. Yet a kingdom like this, with no land and no geographic boundaries, had a serious political dilemma. Anyone could claim to be a citizen in this kingdom. And Jesus predicted that all sorts of impostors would. Matthew seven twenty one through twenty three, also Matthew twenty four five, twenty five forty four through forty five. This in turn produced a public relations nightmare. Such impostors would bring the king's name into disrepute. Remember, this kingdom was supposed to be for those who are repentant, poor in spirit, and humble like children. It was to be a new kind of society. But if literally anyone, all by himself or herself, could just start claiming to be a citizen, there was going to be a mess. Forget about any new society. The citizens of the previous administration were marked off by the fact that they lived in a particular land. And even when they left the land, they had a number of distinctives such as circumcision, the Sabbath, and various dietary restrictions. But how would a landless, borderless kingdom like Jesus's mark off its citizens? Who would exercise border patrol when there are no borders? Intermission, the White House Press Room. Before proceeding with this story of Jesus's kingdom, let's take a brief intermission. Think about what's at stake in the larger conversation about church membership. We are talking about representing God himself on planet Earth. That was Israel's job, right? Walk onto almost any college campus today, and you'll hear the campus pronounced in unison, no one can claim to represent God. But that's exactly what we're talking about. Are you beginning to see how important this topic is? No? Let me try another illustration. Let's suppose we walked away from the Italian bistro and and over to the White House and walk straight into the press room. I once knew somebody who looked, who knew somebody who took me into the press room. He took a picture of me standing at the press room, podium looking very out of place. You might know the podium I'm talking about. It's often in the news. The presidential seal is emblazoned on it. Behind it are a blue curtain and an American flag, along with a suspended oval medallion that reads the White House. It is, perhaps, the most powerful podium in the world. From that podium, wars have been announced, markets have been moved, whole economies have been marginalized, international treaties have been explained, millions, even billions of lives have been impacted. Now, here's my question for you. Have you spoken on behalf of the US president from that podium? Have you stared into the studio lights and the cameras of the White House, press courts, and officially represented the president's mind? I assume the answer is no. The president must officially authorize you to represent his mind. Not even his closest friends or family members take the global stage and presume to do that. The stakes are too high for anyone to do otherwise. Okay, here's another question. Have you ever spoken on behalf of Jesus and his kingdom? Has anyone authorized you to represent this king's mind? Representing Jesus is no inconsequential office either. In fact, Jesus, we saw in chapter 1, has more power and authority than the president. His words will never fail. His decisions will impact all eternity. Jesus has imperium, we said. My guess is that many Christians have never stopped to consider whether it's legitimate for them to claim to speak for Jesus. Ever since the fall, We human beings have felt entitled to do whatever we want, and we carry that sense of entitlement right into our Christianity. In truth, 
Human beings do not have the right to do anything apart from God's authorization. And the same is true for Jesus' kingdom. We can only legitimately act where he has given us permission to act. An individual human being cannot suddenly decide that he or she belongs to Jesus' kingdom and therefore has the right to stand in front of planet Earth and officially represent Jesus. You would not claim to do that for the president. Why would you claim to do it for the king of presidents? Okay, the intermission is over. What's the takeaway? It's just as presumptuous to assume you have the authority to represent King Jesus, the divine son, as it is to assume you have the authority to represent the president of the United States. More so, in fact. Someone has to authorize you. The story continues. The Keys of the Kingdom We return to our story about Jesus' landless, borderless kingdom. Who has the authority for publicly declaring who is a citizen and who is not? For starters, Peter and the Apostles. One day, Jesus warned the Apostles not to trust the teachings of Israel, Israel's leaders. Matthew 16, 1-12 their term of office had expired, and they would be vacating the Capitol building shortly, carrying the contents of their desks in boxes. Then he asked them who they thought he was. Peter, probably on behalf of all the apostles, answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Verse 16. Jesus affirmed Peter's answer, saying that it had come from the Father in heaven. Then he continued, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Matthew sixteen eighteen through 19 This is the first of two times Jesus uses the word church. Here he is talking about the universal church, the assembly of all Christians from all ages who will gather at the end of history. Jesus will build this end time assembly. How will he build it? He will build it on this rock. What rock? Theologians have long debated whether the rock is Peter or Peter's confession. In fact, I think you have to say both. Theologian Edmund Clowney writes, the confession cannot be separated from Peter, neither can Peter be separated from his confession. Jesus will build his church not on words and not on people, but on people who believe the right gospel words, like the word himself who became flesh. Jesus will build the church on confessors. Jesus then gave Peter and the apostles the keys of the kingdom which gave Peter the authority to do what Jesus had just done with him, to act as God's official representative on earth for affirming true gospel confessions and confessors. The interactions between heaven and earth in this passage are amazing to consider. Peter rightly confessed who Jesus was, and Jesus said that Peter's right answer came from the Father in heaven. Though Jesus was on earth, he spoke on behalf of heaven. Then, in the very next breath, he authorized Peter to do the same thing, to represent what's bound and loosed in heaven by binding and loosing on earth. Bible scholars sometimes talk about binding and loosing as a judicial or rabbinic activity, which is helpful for understanding this phrase. For instance, a rabbi might decide whether some law applied to, bound, a particular person in a certain set of circumstances. Jesus essentially gave the apostles this kind of authority, the authority to stand in front of a confessor, to consider his or her confession, to consider his or her life, and to announce an official judgment on heaven's behalf. Is that the right confession? Is that a true confessor? In other words, the apostles had heaven's authority for declaring who on earth is a kingdom citizen and therefore represents heaven. 
I'm not saying that Jesus established a church membership program in Matthew 16, but he indisputably established the church, which is its members, and he gave it the authority of the keys to continue building itself, effectively the authority to receive and dismiss members. The authority of the keys is the authority to assess a person's gospel words and deeds and to render a judgment. Two chapters later, where Jesus uses the word church for the second and last time, we see those keys put into action. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, Truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Matthew eighteen fifteen through 20 The passage begins with a picture of a brother sinning, and his sin is out of step with his confession of faith. Jesus then recommends four rounds of confrontation, In round one, the confrontation is kept private. If the sinner repents, his confession of faith regains its credibility and the confrontation stops. His life matches his confession. He is, once more, representing Jesus rightly. In round two, the confrontation expands to include two or three witnesses, as in an Old Testament judicial setting. In round three, the whole church or assembly becomes involved. If the sinner still does not repent, round four ensues, which involves removing the individual from the covenant community, treating him like an outsider. Sometimes this is called church discipline or excommunication. Jesus then invokes the keys of the kingdom again. Whatever the church binds on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever the church looses on earth will be loosed in heaven. And Jesus is not addressing the apostles or the universal church here. He's envisioning a local church. The local church, it appears, has been given the apostolistic keys of the kingdom. As a result, the local church has heaven's authority for declaring who on earth is a kingdom citizen and therefore represents heaven. Jesus has authorized the local church to stand in front of a confessor to consider the confessor's confession, to consider his or her life, and to announce an official judgment on heaven's behalf. Is that the right confession? Is this a true confessor? It's just like Jesus did with Peter, and it will do these things with the ordinances that are established in Matthew 26 and Matthew 28, the Lord's Supper and baptism. Matthew 18 which is filled with even more earth and heaven talk than Matthew 16, presents a crystal clear picture of this authority in the context of church discipline. But the ability to remove someone from membership presupposes an overarching authority to assess a person's gospel words and deeds and to render a judgment. This authority begins the moment a person shows up in the church building doors claiming, as Peter did, that Jesus is the Christ. The state's representative authority, we said in chapter 1, is seen most clearly in its ability to end a person's life. Likewise, the church's representative authority in Christ's kingdom is seen most clearly in its ability to remove a person from citizenship in Christ's kingdom. In both cases, the full extent of institutional authority is indicated by the power to decisively end a person's membership through death in one case, and excommunication in the other. Yet, it's the same authority that is exercised when two or three gather in Jesus' name. Matthew 18.20 
and baptize a person in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Matthew twenty eight nineteen. Licensing the person as an official, card-carrying disciple. As such, when it comes to a Christian's discipleship to Christ, the local church is the Christian's highest authority on earth. No, it's not an absolute authority, any more than the state is. But Christ does mean for Christians to submit to the oversight of local churches by virtue of their citizenship in his kingdom. Will the local church exercise the keys perfectly? No. It will make mistakes just as every other authority established by Jesus makes mistakes. As such, the local church will be an imperfect representation of Christ's end-time gathering. But the fact that it makes mistakes just as presidents or par- and parents do, does not mean it's without an authoritative mandate. Does all this mean that what a local church does on earth actually changes a person's status in heaven? No. The church's job is like an ambassador's or an embassy's. Remember what I said about visiting the U.S. Embassy in Brussels when my passport expired. The embassy didn't make me a citizen. It formally affirmed it in a way I could not myself. So with a local church. What is a local church? Let's return to my single sentence institutional definition of a local church. A local church, I said, is a group of Christians who regularly gather in Christ's name to officially affirm and oversee one another's membership in Jesus Christ and his kingdom through gospel preaching and gospel ordinances. Notice the five parts of this definition a group of Christians, a regular gathering, a congregation-wide exercise of affirmation and oversight, the purpose of officially representing Christ and his rule on earth, they gather in his name, the use of preaching and ordinances for these purposes. Just as a pastor's pronouncement transforms a man and a woman into a married couple, so the latter four bullet points transform an ordinary group of Christians spending time together at the park, presto, into a local church. The gathering is important for a number of reasons. One is that it's where we Christians go public to declare our highest allegiance. It's the outpost, or embassy, giving a public face to our future nation. And it's where we bow before our king, only we call it worship. The pharaohs of the world may oppose us, but God draws his people out of the nations to worship him. He will form his mighty congregation. The gathering is also where our king enacts his rule through preaching, the ordinances, and discipline. The gospel sermon explains the law of our nation. It declares the name of our king and explains the sacrifice he made to become our king. It teaches us of his ways and confronts us in our disobedience, and it assures us of his imminent return. Through baptism and the Lord's Supper, the church waves the flag and dons the army uniform of our nation. It makes us visible. To be baptized is to identify ourselves with the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as well as to identify our union with Christ's death and resurrection. Matthew twenty eight nineteen, Romans six three through five. To receive the Lord's Supper is to proclaim His death and our membership in His body. First Corinthians eleven twenty six through twenty nine, Matthew twenty six twenty six through twenty nine. God wants His people to be known and marked off. He wants a line between the church and the world. What is the local church? It's the institution that Jesus created and authorized to pronounce the gospel of the kingdom, to affirm gospel professors, to oversee their discipleship, and to expose imposters. As I said in chapter 1, we don't join churches as we join clubs. We submit to them as we submit to the government. And that brings us to church membership. What is church membership? What is church membership? It's a declaration of citizenship in Christ's kingdom. It's a passport. 
It's an announcement made in the press room of Christ's kingdom. It's the declaration that you are an official, licensed, card-carrying, bona fide Jesus representative. To offer another clunky definition, we can say that church membership is a formal relationship between a church and a Christian, characterized by the church's affirmation and oversight of a Christian's discipleship and the Christian's submission to living out his or her discipleship in the care of the church. Notice again the several elements that are present. A church body formally affirms an individual's profession of faith and baptism as credible. It promises to give oversight to that individual's discipleship. The individual formally submits his or her discipleship to the service and authority of this body and its leaders. The church body says to the individual, We recognize your profession of faith, baptism, and discipleship to Christ as valid. Therefore, we publicly affirm and acknowledge you as belonging to Christ and the oversight of our fellowship. Principally, the individual says to the church body, Insofar as I recognize you as a faithful gospel-declaring church, I submit my presence and my discipleship to your love and oversight. In some ways, all this is like the I do of a marriage ceremony, which is why some have referred to a local church covenant. Church membership, in other words, is all about a church taking specific responsibility for you and you for a church. Clearly, the elders or leaders of the church have a large and representative role to play here when it comes to the church's oversight, but we'll get to that topic a little later. Notice then how this definition helps to explain the difference between my relationship with Coyle, who belongs to my church, and my relationship with Mike, who belongs to another church. Coyle and I receive the affirmation and oversight of one embassy, while Mike receives these things from another. It's as though two of us get our passports authorized at the U.S. Embassy in Brussels, while the other gets it done at the U.S. Embassy in Paris. It's true that a Christian must choose to join a church, but that does not make it a voluntary organization. We are, in fact, obligated to choose a local church just as we are obligated to choose Christ. Having chosen Christ, a Christian has no choice but to choose a church to join. Chapter 4. What are church and its members like? Do you know what a mixed metaphor is? It's using two different images that don't fit together in a single utterance. You might remember Jiminy Cricket from Pinocchio exclaiming, You buttered your bread, now sleep in it! Or, have you heard the phrase, taking a flying hike? To this day, I sometimes repeat the words of Biff, the thick-headed bully from the Back to the Future movies. Let's make like a tree and get out of here. Then there's humorous Dave Barry's description of the 1929 stock market crash. The nation's seemingly prosperous economy was revealed to be merely a paper tiger with feet of clay living in a straw house of cards that had cried wolf once too often. Yet, it's not only the comedy writers who mix their metaphors. Poets do as well, though their mixtures are more subtle. T.S. Eliot opens one of his poems with a line about forgetful snows, and William Butler Yeats writes about treading on dreams. Strictly speaking, snow cannot be forgetful, and dreams cannot be tread upon. But the unexpected pairing of metaphors in both cases allows us to see true things that we may not ordinarily see with more literal language. You might have noticed that the authors of the New Testament often mix their metaphors, and deliberately so, like the poets. Think of Paul saying to the Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Ephesians 1.18 Hearts don't have eyes but mixing them up helps us to see something deep and profound. Photos of Parading Fruit Bowls When the New Testament authors start talking about the church and its its members, 
they push this mixing of metaphors into hyperdrive, like hitting the turbo button on a racehorse. Paul talks about being baptized into a body, as if one could be immersed into a torso. Peter talks about Christians as living stones, itself a mixed metaphor. And then he says that these living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. 1 Peter 2.5 If I had written a sentence like that in my high school English class, my teacher would have picked up his red pen and gone to town. I'm not sure what he would have done in town once he got there, but at least he would have had his red pen with him. When you open up the Bible and read what God says about the church, you find yourself staring at one big mixed metaphor. We read that the church is like a body, a flock of sheep, branches of a vine, a bride, a temple, God's building, a people, exiles, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, salt of the earth, the Israel of God, the elect lady, and on and on. The images keep coming, one piled on top of the other. It's like flipping through a photo album of images, or maybe watching a parade, or maybe reaching into a fruit bowl. I guess it's like looking at a photo album filled with parading fruit bowls. In the last chapter, we considered the institutional local church, the assembly of believers that Christ instituted for the specific purpose of exercising the keys of the kingdom and making disciples through preaching in the ordinances. That is what a local church is. It's a key-carrying body established by Jesus for the sake of everyone he has purchased with his blood. But ending our description here would be like saying a marriage is the marital covenant, while saying nothing about all the activities that the marital covenant makes uniquely and wonderfully possible, such as partnership building and physical intimacy. The institutional views need to be complemented by an organic view, we said. The rules of an institution, mind you, don't only constrain, they commission, they empower, they build a platform for activity. The keys of the kingdom, followed by Christ's great commission in Matthew 28, enable Christ's disciples to grab hold of the wonders of the new covenant and put them into practice on earth. And this is where all the biblical metaphors for the church come into play. Body, bride, temple, family, and so forth. We live out our bodiness, our brideness, our templeness, and our familiness through the accountability structures of the church's judicial activity of member affirmation, oversight, and discipline. The institutional language of kingdom and keys, you might say, acts like the bowl that holds all the fruit or the album that features the photos. Sure enough, Jesus' kingdom is not metaphorical, at least not in the same way as these other metaphors for the church. Jesus' kingdom really is a kingdom. He really does rule his people, but the church is not really a human body, a bride in a dress, a temple made of bricks, a family of biologically related individuals, and so forth. Those are metaphors. That's why we began with the idea of Christ's kingdom, to help us describe what the church and its members are. But then we need to turn to the organic church, or what a church and its members are like. These members are like a body, like a bride being made ready, like a temple, like a family, like a royal priesthood, and so forth. That's why it's not enough just to say that the church is an embassy of official citizens. When I walked into the U.S. Embassy in Brussels, nobody referred to me as brother as they do at church. Why do they call me a brother at church? Because belonging to a church is belonging to a family of sorts. The church is unlike anything on earth. It's simultaneously family-like, body-like, flock-like. You get the idea. That's a hard picture to draw, even for the best artists. The importance of biblical metaphors for the church. Let me make several more points about these metaphors and why they're so important to understanding church membership. One, 
Each one has a job to do for describing something about our union in a church. Each metaphor teaches us something different about what a church and its members are like. To describe the church as a family is to speak about its relational intimacy and shared identity. To call it a body is to say that its members are mutually dependent, but have different roles. To refer to it as the temple of the spirit is to say that God specially identifies himself and dwells with these people. The language of vine and branch communicates the church's dependence on Jesus and his word for its life. Do you see? Think about it in terms of union. The union of a married couple serves a different purpose than the union of two bricks in a building because they are different kinds of unions. But what's our union within our churches supposed to be like? Like a marital union? A union of bricks? What? Well, we need to borrow words and ideas from all these different images to be able to characterize relationships within a local church. Isn't that amazing? So when people ask me, is church membership even in the Bible? I'm half tempted to reply, no, it's not in the Bible. At least not in the way that you mean. The Bible has a much richer and more complex vision of how Christians should live out their unity in local churches. It's as though we've been looking for apples when really we should be looking for whole bowls of fruit. There's nothing on earth like the local church. Two, we need all these images for describing a church and its members. If all these metaphors or images have a job to do, then we need all of them. You cannot just pick your favorite fruit from the fruit bowl and leave the rest. I'll take the apples and leave the oranges. Thank you. No, you have to grab the whole bowl. In other words, you should think twice before deciding which metaphor for the church is most important. Some Christians in church history have tried to say that the church is more the body of Christ or more the people of God. But that's like saying I'm more a husband than a father or more a father than a husband. I admit, my wife or kids might prefer one or the other, but I'm re irreducibly both. You need the categories father and husband and a number of others to describe who I really am. Unhealthy churches, even denominations, are sometimes the result of church leaders who have picked their favorite metaphors out of the bowl and left the others. They become all intimacy, family, or all hierarchy, body. Three, each of these metaphors gets put into practice locally. Every biblical metaphor for the church becomes embodied, puts on a body, in the local church. The family, the body, the temple, the people. All of these descriptions of Christ's church don't just float around in the air. They become concrete in particular places. They get put into practice locally. But don't all Christians everywhere belong to the family of God? Indeed, they do. But God gives you the opportunity to act like a family with your local church. You treat them first and foremost as your sisters and brothers. Doesn't the body of Christ extend to Christians throughout the world? Of course it does. But you live as the body of Christ in your local church. One of you gets to be the mouth one of you the elbow, and one of you the esophagus. That means you need all of them to describe every living church you have ever encountered. Right there at First Baptist or Second Presbyterian or St. Mark's Lutheran or Grace Community or The Journey, you have the people of God. You have the temple of the Spirit. And you have the body of Christ. You don't have just an arm or an ankle of Christ's body. Paul's description of the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12 provides a great illustration of this. Is Paul referring to the local, local body in Corinth or to the body of Christ universally when he talks about the body and its members in, its pa in this passage? Consider the sentence, Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. That sounds local. But earlier in the chapter, he had included himself. For in one spirit, 
we are all baptized into one body, 1213. Paul wasn't in Corinth, so is he talking about the universal church? The issue is not so difficult when we remember that the universal church is present in the local church. The local church is an outpost of the future universal church. That means Paul leans now in one direction, now in another. When he writes, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, 1 Corinthians 12.22, I would argue that he's leaning into an emphasis on the local body. Yet when he writes, for in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, 1 Corinthians 12.13, I would argue that he's leaning into a universal emphasis. In short, 1 Corinthians 12 is a wonderful illustration of how a local church should begin to embody today what Christ's end-time gathering will look like. To state this the other way around, your membership in a local body now presents a picture of your membership in his end-time body. You might be content for the whole idea of church to exist in your head, but Jesus wasn't so content. He wanted his church and your membership in it to show up in real time. As such, you cannot fulfill your obligations to other Christians and to church leaders without the local church, at least not in the way scripture calls you to fulfill them. And other Christians and church leaders cannot fulfill their obligations to you without the local church. You need a body of Christ to be the body of Christ. You need a family of God to be the family of God. How do you fulfill Jesus' command to love one another? John thirteen thirty four. How do you fulfill Paul's command to carry each other's burdens? Galatians 6, 2. How do you obey Peter's words? Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. 1 Peter 4, 10. You obey all these commands through your membership in the local church. Here's another way to think about what's at stake. How should we respond to the person who claims to be righteous in Christ, but never pursues righteousness? We would say that he was self-deceived, and we would urge him to repent. Those who have been freely given Christ's righteousness, in turn pursue righteousness. Romans 6, 2, also 1 John 3, 7. By the same token, how should we respond to the person who claims to belong to the body of Christ universally, but never actually joins a body of Christ on earth? We should say the person is self-deceived and should repent. Christ's body, the Father's people, and the Spirit's temple will fully gather in glory. But, amazingly, you can find imperfect expressions, outposts, or embassies of that gathering right now in the local church. There's nothing on earth like the local church. It comes from the end of time. 4. The metaphors aren't really metaphors, but shadows. You can see this in Ephesians 5. Paul writes, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Ephesians 5, 31 through 32. Paul is talking about marriage, but then he unexpectedly changes the subject. He says marriage refers to Christ and the church. Marriage is a symbol or shadow of Christ and the church. We get it backward if we think that marriage is the reality and that Christ's love for the church is a symbol of marriage. It's as if God, before he created the world, said to himself, How can I weave into the fabric of creation a symbol or shadow of my son's covenant love for the church? How can I proclaim this universally so that everyone sees it and realizes that they are standing in the shadow of something very, very big? Answer. He created marriage. It's the shadowy outline that points to the real reality, Christ and the church. The same is true, I believe, for all the biblical metaphors for the church. They are the shadows of something even greater. Think also of Paul's reference to the Heavenly Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. 
Ephesians 3.15 God placed earthly fathers on earth so that all the world would have a shadowy outline of what our relationship with the Heavenly Father is to be like. Why do you think God has created brothers and sisters? Again, so that everyone gets a dim sense of the true reality that begins now in the local church and awaits us completely in glory. What about branches on the vine? It gives us a dim picture of our dependence on the word of Christ. I trust that, in glory, our utter, complete, and total dependence on him will become even plainer. Even Old Testament metaphors for the church, like the temple, though pointing backwards to the life of Israel, point forward to greater realities in the age to come. There's nothing like it. Are you beginning to understand why it keeps saying there's nothing in the world like the local church and its members? The relationships that we share in the local church will ultimately prove more interconnected than a physical body, more safe than a father's embrace, more collegial than brotherly love, more resilient than a stone house, more holy than a priesthood, and on and on we can go. That is what Jesus has prepared for us in glory. And this is what we begin to practice right now at First Baptist or Second Presbyterian or The Journey. We practice it with all those still sinful and still strange people who step on our toes, just as we step on theirs. What are the local church and its members like? They are like a body, like a bride being made ready, like a temple, like a family, like a royal priesthood. But in every case, even more. Back to reality. Having said all this, every church member on the planet knows that life in the local church doesn't always feel this way. So interconnected, so safe, so collegial, so resilient, so holy. In fact, it can feel the opposite. One woman recently left my own church feeling disappointed and hurt by our church. She wrote to me in an email. Regardless of whether they are believers or not, the members of my family will go to links for me like no church family ever would. And so, honestly, I no longer buy that family and community picture the way I bought it before. The family I've been born into and the friends I've had for a lifetime will be the people I can truly count on. These are the words of someone whose hopes have been dashed. She was taught the church was one thing, and she experienced something very different. More interconnected than a family? More safe than a father's embrace? More collegial than siblings? Really? Not in her experience. Maybe not in yours. What shall we say about realities like these? Here's what I said to her. For starters, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for our sin and the hurt we've caused. I trust the sin is real and the hurt is real. Next, please forgive us. We need you to forgive us so that we can be reconciled in Christ, even if we don't belong to the same congregation. Finally, will you look to the gospel with me? I think of Peter, this rock on which the church is built, promising Jesus that he wouldn't deny him and then denying him. Later, Peter wouldn't eat with an entire class of church members, the Gentiles. Still, Jesus died for betrayers and hypocrites and jerks and racists like these, like this Peter. And Peter is the one who, later, talked about the church as living stones and a spiritual house. Really, Peter? Have you been so strong, resilient, and spiritual with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Here's the good news. It's not the strength and love of people like Peter that we have to rely upon and trust. It's the strength and love of Christ. Through his work on the cross, we have been made his body, his family, his temple, his people, his flock, his joy and crown. He has made us what we are, not us. Now he's perfecting us to become what we, strangely, already are. So hang tight. Stick with us. Persevere in forgiveness and love. 
We'll get there. Not because of us, but because of him. Your brother in him, Jonathan. 12 Reasons Membership Matters 1. It's Biblical Jesus established the local church and all the apostles did their ministry through it. The Christian life in the New Testament is church life. Christians today should expect and desire the same. 2. The church is its members. To be a church in the New Testament is to be one of its members. Read through Acts. And you want to be a part of the church because that's who Jesus came to rescue and reconcile to himself. 3. It's a prerequisite for the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a meal for the gathered church, that is, for members. See 1 Corinthians eleven twenty through 33 And you want to take the Lord's Supper. It's the team flag that makes the church team visible to the nations. 4. It's how you officially represent Jesus. Membership is the church's affirmation that you are a citizen of Christ's kingdom and therefore a passport carrying Jesus' representative before the nations. And you want your representation to be authorized. Closely related to this. Five, it's how you declare your highest allegiance. Your membership on the team, which becomes visible when you wave the flag of the Lord's Supper, is a public testimony that your highest allegiance belongs to Jesus. Trials and persecution may come, but your only words are, I am a Christian. Six, it's how you embody and experience biblical images. It's within the accountability structures of the local church that Christians live and experience the inner connectivity of his body, the spiritual fullness of his temple, and the safety and intimacy and shared identity of his family. Seven, it's how you serve other Christians. Membership helps you to know which Christians on planet Earth you are specifically responsible to love, serve, warn, and encourage. It enables you to fulfill your biblical responsibilities to Christ's body. For example, see Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, 25 through 32. 8. It's how you follow Christian leaders. Membership helps you to know which Christian leaders on planet Earth you are called to obey and follow. Again, it allows you to fulfill your biblical responsibility to them. See Hebrews 13, 7, 17. 9. It helps Christian leaders lead. Membership lets Christian leaders know which Christians on planet Earth they will give an account for. Acts twenty twenty eight, First Peter five two. Ten, it enables church discipline. It gives you the biblically prescribed place to participate in the work of church discipline responsibly, wisely, and lovingly. Eleven, it gives structure to your Christian life. It places an individual Christian's claim to obey and follow Jesus into a real life setting where authority is actually exercised over us. See John 14:15, 15, 1 John 2:19, 4, 20 through 21. It's God's discipling program. 12. It builds a witness and invites the nations. Membership puts the alternative rule of Christ on display for the watching universe. See Matthew 5:13. John thirteen thirty four through thirty five, Ephesians three ten, First Peter two nine through twelve. The very boundaries which are drawn around the membership of a church yield a society of people that invites the nations to do something better. It's God's evangelism program.